Uh, there's a lot of things that are assumed about anti-Semitism, but we're going to make sure that's clear for you as well to fill that gap. And also how it's used. We also want to offer a bit of an overview on anti-Semitism history. We know that oftentimes when you're preparing to become a social studies teacher, that that's not always, you don't get the full scope. Uh, particularly today, we'll talk about why it's important through oral testimonies because it paints a different picture. The next goal we have is really to talk about some categorical teaching units, and that will come throughout this series and, and references that, uh, to tools that you can use to help fill in some of those gaps, particularly in the area of oral testimonies, and really how oral testimonies can be a form of resistance and a useful tool in the classroom. And our oral testimonies, as we move on to the pedagogical principles, um, Rick, oral testimonies are a foundational piece in the teaching of the Holocaust. Um, there are nine pedagogical principles that we follow at the Zuckerman Holocaust Center that ground our work, that ground our writing, that grounds our tours, and any interaction in an educational capacity. Um, these pedagogical principles uh, we get from Echoes and Reflections. Uh, we work in partnership with Echoes. Uh, that also works in partnership with the uh, um, Shoah Foundation, as well as the ADL and Yad Vashem. Uh, so one thing for educators, that you can know is that all of the resources and what we share with you today are of the highest standard, highest quality. They have been researched and peer reviewed and continue to be um, as we move into contemporary times and various aspects with either oral testimonies or artifacts that we'll talk about next week um, come to light. Uh, we take a look at these pedagogical principles as um, a litmus test, as ground as, as grounding measures in order for you to ensure that you are reaching all of your students with your content, uh, honoring the Holocaust with fidelity to historical content. And the first is defining terms, making sure that we are all clear on what we are talking about, both within your classroom and here in this space, uh, about anti-Semitism and what do we mean by the Holocaust, providing background information and contextualizing history. That's very important, as you know, as you do every day in your classrooms, both through text and direct teaching, uh, that contextualization within the scope of time is imperative for understanding for our students. Teaching the human story, that's going to be the cornerstone of what we talk about today. And we're going to do that by using primary source materials. The individuals that you hear today were there. They lived it. They went through the horror of the Holocaust. They were brave enough to come forward and talk very openly um, about the various aspects of the Holocaust that they endured so that others could learn again, so that the Holocaust will never repeat. And this goes hand in hand with making the Holocaust re relevant and encouraging inquiry-based learning and critical thinking. Um, that is a cornerstone of the work that we do here. And we also know as Rick is going to go into in just a few minutes, um, it's the core of having those robust discussions with your students in order to deep dive into conversations that are crucial and critical to further learning, not only about the Holocaust, but other aspects of social studies um, that we want our young people to know as they move into an adult world as uh, part of, an active part of society. And that is through fostering understanding and ensuring a supportive learning environment. These pedagogical principles, these nine tenets are basically our sieve that we run everything through to make sure that we have the highest quality and the highest fidelity of content and materials for our students and for our learners in all different educational platforms. I know, Rick, you're going to connect this now to um, social studies standards, sure, and sure. you can know that as you're using these materials, um, which will come to you, this folder will be complete and live for you to use uh, within your educational settings, um, to know that this connects very cleanly and clearly with what you are accountable for and have deep knowledge of as a social studies educator. Rick? So so our work really comes from, you know, initially from the, I mean, ah, there we go. Obviously, many of you here probably know, but if you don't know, you know Public Act 170 in 2016 was the, the Michigan Holocaust Genocide Education Act. Uh, this is really the, the forefront, and the Zuckerman Holocaust Center was actually a, a large player in how that law really came into play. But the, the importance of that law really was the fact that it then required like many of the states that you see in blue, uh, 
that we provide a certain number of hours of instruction when it comes to genocide, Holocaust, and then we also work to model core curriculum strategies for teachers. Uh, and this is where we kind of come into play as, as, a, as a resource for everyone in the state that is largely free uh, to, to be able to do that. Uh, it was required for grades A through 12. Uh, many schools we know do this through social studies, but many of them also kind of use pieces of this in other subject areas. And then it was also mandated that it was going to be included on state assessments, which if you're a teacher here, you probably already know that. Um, but it also established the Governor's Council on Genocide and Holocaust Education, uh, which was really charged with researching strategies and content, making some suggested recommendations, really just to get us all to teach a bit better in this area. We know that when you get trained as a social studies teacher in college, you do you learn all of it. And so to be an expert in every one single thing, it's not always that simple. And we firmly believe that the Holocaust is a very complex thing to have to teach. There's a lot of factors to think about. Uh, certainly when working with students, trauma-informed practices and all of those things have to be considered. Uh, but more importantly is promoting genocide education to the general population with this group and then submitting regular reports to the legislature. Now, how does that then tie to our standards? Well, you know, we all know that the K-12 social studies standards are, 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 if you're a teacher here, you obviously know that these are at the forefront of what we do. Specifically, the social studies standards that are referenced are, are, are listed here, um, both in world history, and there are references to U.S. history as well. But specifically, when we focus on uh, 7.26, for example, we get into the consequences. And one of the things that we really like to focus on and the reason we believe in oral testimonies is because the consequences can be told best through those that survived it. And the ramifications and the lead up and the propaganda, all of those things fall into play. And the oral testimonies are a true testament that often gets left out. And typically our instructional practices focuses on the perpetrators. Whereas when you use oral testimonies, we focus on the victims and survivors. And that's really kind of where we come from. And that's our lens. Uh, but we also understand that there's the whole you know, responsible citizen component, which we'll talk about how all of this overlaps in a minute, and then all of the subject areas that we have to teach. But we also understand a lot of schools are already using things like Ella Gazelle's Night, Diary of Anne Frank, some are using Mouse, to, uh, for example. And you can actually build context within all of this stuff, whether you're teaching it in language arts or you're teaching it in history class so that students get a robust experience that's accurate and it paints the picture of the whole situation, not just what they're reading in the book. Um, and then of course, there's the whole idea of the art of inquiry. Uh, within all of our training and all of our suggestions, we, we, we get the instructional shifts and our pedagogical principles overlap with that as well. Now thinking about how, how does this all come together then? You know, we have these, high school standards that we have to teach. And we understand there's a lot there. Uh, and I think Dr. Rice mentioned at the beginning about narrowing our focus instead of you know, creating more depth instead of more breadth. But then we also have these instructional shifts that are you know, outlined in the C3 standards at the heart of inquiry. And, but then we layer on that with now with the pedagogical principles. And what I want you to notice here is this idea that the pedagogical principles really are kind of overlapped for a reason. They, they get at the same things that the instructional shifts are getting at in C3. Inquiry, developing questions, collaborative context, you know, think, taking informed action, fostering empathy, and at the end of the day, articulate like a historian. One way to articulate like a historian is to hear from the actual people who went through the history. And this is why we focus on oral testimonies and how to use them. And at the end of the day, what is our real goal? Our real goal is to share the human story. And whether we're teaching about slavery or we're teaching about suffrage, the important part of the movement that I think Dr. Rice is bringing is the idea that we share the human story behind all of these times in our history. And if we, if we can teach through those lenses, we get a better perspective of how the impacts and implications play out even today, as we see other movements and we see other things, because things are simple. And we don't want kids, we want students to learn history, but we also want them to employ and take action. So when they see things that are wrong. Dan, do you want to add anything to that? 
No, um, what I do uh, want to share is that when we are talking about uh, the pedagogical principles and as we move into content at this point, uh, everything is aligned with our pedagogical principles. So as you see numbers at the headers, uh, different numbers, those are the numbers within the pedagogical principles that are aligning with the concept we're presenting at that time. Again, this is something that is done on a regular basis, is having content researched and aligned with research-based best practice for educating students, both in the middle school, high school, and university level um, with traumatic content. That's very, very important that we have our students come safely in and safely out. So as we go to the next slide, for clarity, and this would be one of the first principles that we're going to follow, um, is defining terms and creating that context. So if we take a look here, and we define what the Holocaust is. Holocaust comes from um, a Hebrew word, Shoah, uh, which is an English name referring to the systematic destruction of European Jewry at the hands of the Nazis during World War II. When, so when we're talking about the Holocaust, that's what we're talking about. The Holocaust officially began at the invasion of Poland, September 1st, 1939, at the beginning of World War II. However, some would argue um, that the, the grooming and everything that led up to 1939, which began back in 1933, with the rise of Hitler as chancellor, um, between 33 and 39, all of that grooming and legislation and anti-Semitic thought was a part of it. So if you are looking at the Holocaust, technically it would be from the beginning of World War II to 1945, but some do move back to 1933. But this is what we're talking about. And it comes from a Greek word, holocoston, which is a translation of the Hebrew word ola. And during biblical times, an ola was a type of sacrifice to God that was totally completely consumed or burnt by fire, nothing left. And you'll see later when we see an oral testimony on the final solution, why the term totally consumed is so important. And over time, the word Holocaust came to be used with reference to large scale slaughter or destruction. But something to be very clear on, when we are talking about the Holocaust, we are talking about a Jewish experience. The Holocaust is what occurred to the Jews because they were Jews, plus other fringe groups, um, homosexuals, Sinti Roma, the gypsies, um, various, um, um, they would say, individuals unworthy of life um, during that time period that we just spoke of from 39 to 45. But this was a Jewish experience primarily with over 6 million individuals being murdered during that time. So if we go to the next slide, when we're clear on what we're talking about, when we're talking about the Holocaust, which is very important to set forth with your students, what are we talking about when we talk about anti-Semitism? And it's very clear uh, in this space, in any educational space or with your students, that they all have the same definition of what anti-Semitism is. And from ECHOS, which is also from Yad Vashem and the ADL, anti-Semitism is the hatred of Jews as a group or as an individual or as a concept. It is the hatred of Jews for being Jews. So if we go to the next slide, Rick, when we're talking about anti-Semitism, it's very, very important to look at the spelling. We have many, many ELA teachers who work cross-categorically with our uh, social studies experts at the middle school and secondary level. And it's very, very important to have a clear understanding of what we're talking about when we're talking about anti-Semitism. Uh, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance um, has addressed this. The document is here. Thank you, Rick, for putting that in. Um, and that is available to you after this presentation within your folder. Um, they wanted to address specifically the spelling of anti-Semitism because the writing and the sharing of anti-Semitism in print, in narrative, in literature, in history books is very, very important to understand where it came from because oftentimes that's where we'll see it. 
um, when you're talking about Semitic, something being Semitic, it's a family of languages that was derived from the Middle East, primarily in North Africa and Western Asia. And so consequently, Semites was a group of people that spoke those languages in that area. And because of the area, it was predominantly Arabs and Jews. Um, but when we're thinking about that, if you're talking about something being anti, anti-Semitic would follow to mean being against this entire group. So if something is anti-Semitic, you're talking about being against an entire group of Semites. But that's not what it meant. Because uh, a German journalist, uh, Marr in 1879, he was going from creating a term and coining a term in order to classify a group because they were moving into um, a pseudoscience that has to do with an elevated um, relevance of a race based upon biological factors, anthropological factors, and different um, um, racial factors. And so consequently, because Jews were Semites themselves, as well as other groups, in order to push this forward, this was a perfect, this was a perfect word for him to use. So you were either of this group or you were anti-Semitic. So you were either with or not based upon a biological and a racial profile. This was a pseudoscience. It was very, very big in the 19th century towards the latter parts in order to have groups um, from political and other financial standpoints be the, the correct group. And then you have the other, you have the outside group. Um, he was a German journalist and consequently this was used very heavily in propaganda. And anti-Semitism was meant to mean anti-Jewish this gained popularity. It laid dormant a little bit in the early 1900s, but it gained popularity with the Nazis because it was a very, very um, easy term to wrap around. Um, most groups um, and most uh, other languages never hyphenated the word, um, but when you hyphenate the word, it also stresses the word anti. So anti-Semitism, anti-Jewish. It makes it very clear from a Nazi lens, who is the other and who is not. So anti-Semitism is a unified term now to mean hatred of Jews. Um, the hyphen should not be used and it should not be um, capitalized unless it's at the beginning of a sentence. Uh, the reason I say this is because autocorrect on your computers will often put the hyphen in. And so you have to manually go in and take it out and often it will capitalize it. Um, because it's, again, going back to that piece of lumping an entire group of people together, Semites, which it's not. Anti-Semitism refers specifically to Jews. So if we go on to the next slide, and we're talking about anti-Semitism historically, and we're looking at anti-Semitism being the hatred of Jews as a group, an individual, or a concept. This is not something that Hitler invented. This is something that Hitler capitalized on because these sentiments have been around for thousands of years from the beginning of Christianity, from the Jewish faith and Christian and the clashing with other faiths, um, even within the Jewish faith um, from being more orthodox and traditional um, to various levels of traditional faith with Christianity. There was a clashing there. And especially from the times of Christ, um, there were many, many Christians that blamed the Jews for the killing of Christ. And so consequently that rift there, Christians against the Jews, there was, there was that other there's, there's Christianity and there's those that have caused the death of Christ. Um, that is a very, very co powerful concept. And when you are talking about religion, this is the base for many people's values, ideals, and beliefs. This is something that has been talked about and going on for thousands of years uh, back and forth. So if we go to the next piece, um, Rick, and we're talking about um, it moving into the Middle Ages, of course, being from uh, 500 Common Era to 1500, Jews were seen as outsiders. 
And oftentimes they would work against Jews in order to gain favor with Rome. Um, oftentimes uh, Romans would tolerate Jews, um, definitely persecuted them, persecuted them with taxation, owning of property and the various professions that they could um, be engaged in. Um, they were not allowed, Jews were not allowed to um, be a part of specific trades, but they were allowed to be involved with money trades and banking because for um, uh, many different groups, Banking, unlike now, was not considered um, a great profession to be in because when the Romans would come around and collect taxes, they usually didn't do it with smiles and flowers. Uh, you knew that they were coming. They would seize property. They would seize a lot of things if you could not pay your taxes and have everything in line financially um, with the government. Consequently, dealing with money and banking was kind of seen as a fringe profession. Well, the Jews as a group became very, very good at money and banking because those were some of the few professions that they were allowed to do as they were ostracized uh, from other professions within the Roman Empire. Um, Black death occurring in the 1300s, um, Jews were blamed for that as well. They were blamed for poisoning the wells. Um, they were blamed for using the, the children. Um, of others, of Christians, of other groups, uh, the blood of children within traditional rituals, all kinds of far-fetched ideas. Um, and consequently, they were expelled, they were killed, and Jews were also moved to convert to a faith or to a sect that the Romans felt would be more conducive to them living within the Roman Empire in a more comfortable way for uh, the Romans and those that were anti-Semitic at the time. So if we move into 19th century and we look at stereotypes and enlightenment and integration, um, you are moving into a time where legally and equal rights were, were coming more to a forefront. Jews were, were being assimilated with other groups, were being allowed to be involved more heavily in culture and with other activities. Um, but there were many that did not agree with that. They didn't think that was such a great idea. They didn't feel that they were capable as a, a, a Jewish group, as a people, that they were not able to join in um, and provide as much as others within that group. So there were, there were um, different rifts, different arguments, both politically, financially, that anti-Semitism played very heavily in. So even during the time of enlightenment, um, they just didn't feel that Jews could assimilate and be a part of that enlightenment. Um, they thought that they had plots to take over the world. And consequently, this moved into, as we're moving into the 17 and 1800s, primarily the late 1800s, as we move to the next piece, and we're talking about pseudoscience. They were moving to um, um, facets of Jews that focused on them racially. When you're talking about racism, which has to do with other topics within the social studies um, and within other historical discussions, there are new stereotypes that are based upon scientific terms. I had mentioned this before when we were talking about the definition of anti-Semitism. Um, scientific terms to match pure science. So based upon biology and anthropology, basically Jews were physically different. They came from a different race. They were very strong people, but they were very dangerous. Um, being Jewish is just in your blood. They were born this way. So consequently, other groups can't run from it or convert them out of it. And this made people very, very nervous because they it, it moved from um, Jewish tradition and Jewish culture now into racism. It's in essence not something that can be changed or altered. Jews are Jews by blood and consequently they are a permanent threat. It's not something that can be fixed. So as we move into Hitler and the Nazi party, Hitler capitalized on that fear because you're looking at only about a uh, 20 to 30 year time span before he rises as chancellor in 1933. This fueled the desire for the annihilation of Ju the Jews. He said, for thousands of years, the Jews have been our plight. 
all they do is cause us problems. So consequently, as we look at this circle, many people will go back thousands of years, they'll go back 20 years, they'll go back 100 years to look at the roots of anti-Semitism. And many people unfortunately feel that anti-Semitism came about because of of uh, Hitler and the Nazi party. He was just fanning the flames and, with, and was going with an ideology that has been around with us and unfortunately still is uh, for thousands of years. So if we go on to the next slide here, Rick, we're going to take a look at the Holocaust through oral testimony. And when we look at, the, we have four different pieces here. Uh, we picked some that would take us from the beginning to the end of the Holocaust. However, there are many, many units of studies, which you'll see on the left rail. This comes from Echoes and Reflections, and they have various lesson plans. Rick is going to be sharing that with you in our third session. This is just a sampling. So we wanted to share with you four different testimonies. The, the impact of oral testimonies on historical teachings, first off and foremost, is that these are recorded testimonies, primary sources from people who were actually there. Because of technology and the times that we live in, we are able to capture these testimonies. Consequently, being able to use them in your classrooms, which you can do through Echoes and Reflections, free of charge, all categorized, everything is there for you, is a powerful, powerful resource for you to get right to that human story because it takes the written history to a very personal primary level. It clearly defines actions and terms and it contextualizes history in a way that printed text just by lack of human voice, cannot. So she was in 33, really. But I had very good friends of whom I knew that they were members of the Nazi party since 1928. And she was one of my best friends. She didn't care that I was Jewish and I didn't care that she was a Nazi. She was one of my sports friends and we got along very well. But then, of course, in 1933, everything changed. Like, overnight, you could not go into a, a public place. No restaurants, no swimming pools, no movies, n nothing. You couldn't, you, you were not allowed in any public place anymore. And uh, the people that you knew wouldn't talk to you anymore. Friends that you had, they would shun you, most of them. Uh, not because they hated us all of a sudden, but they were all afraid because that was that was the way it was. You talk to a Jew and you'll be punished. It was very hard. I was 19 years old and all of a sudden I was shut off from everything. I got a letter from my sports club in Ulm that I wasn't welcome there anymore because I was Jewish. And that, would, that, that was the thing that I loved to do most, as I said before, sports. And all of a sudden that was finished. There was nothing I could do. We just were really vegetating, if you want to call it that. So. so as we can see from that clip, this is a very safely in, safely out piece. You are sharing the foundational pieces of the Holocaust in order to contextualize your content, but there are not any gruesome photographs. This is using an oral testimony to share an experience that allows your students to come and listen to this testimony in a way that is safe for them to process and in a manner that, make, that, that connects them to the human story. Joseph Morton talks about the ghettos. He was born in Ludge, Poland. Um, he survived the ghettos. He survived um, the extermination and concentration camps of Auschwitz, Moldorf, Dachau, Kaufring, Munchen, Alec. In May 19. And Sorry. he's going to talk about his experience within the ghettos. Basically, we're taking what Margaret said and said, how did this play out in real life? Joseph is going to talk about that right now. In 40, they closed, they closed us in. You know, they, they came in in 1939, in September. By 1940, they enclosed the ghetto. And that's when the real problem started. They put up wired walls all around the 
whole section what they picked as the ghetto. And matter of fact, they had a streetcar going between one of those main streets, which they had to have their transportation, not for us, but for themselves, for the, for the uh, people who lived in Lodge, for the uh, Gentiles and on their own. So they, what they did, they made sections like two walls in between where the streetcar would go. And over the walls, they had a wooden bridge going with stairs going up, going across, and then go down. And certain sections where they have those streetcars going. And uh, like I said, it was a pretty big area, you know. And uh, being in the ghetto, the starvation was very tremendous. People were uh, dying for hunger as it was going on, on the streets. But uh, besides all that, we would, uh, they would uh, come in, close up streets, made everybody go down in the yard or on the streets, and they would always take people away. And that, that was going on all through the years being in the ghetto. At, uh, you, you, you were always living in fear. Besides being hungry, you had the fear with it. So again, as we heard from Mr. Morton, um, he, having experienced the Holocaust, this horror himself, this is um, this clip was only two minutes long. This is something that can be used, revisited, and it's a safely and safely out approach to wrap around your historical context. If you are um, teaching on a part of the war that involves the ghettos or within various countries or in texts that talk about them or the atrocities that occurred under Hitler during the Holocaust. As we move from the ghettos, because from the ghettos, the Jews were deported, usually on train cars, um, which if you happen to come to the Holocaust Center, you will see the, the artifact, which we'll talk about at next session. It is a primary artifact. They were deported to extermination or concentration camps. Mr. Ellis Lewin talks about this very vividly. He was a young child during that time, and he is talking about the final solution. Again, remember, if we go back and we talk about what is Shoah, Shoah and the definition of Holocaust, it is a complete destruction, total consummation. This is what Ellis is talking about, what is happening to the Jews and what he is witnessing as he comes into the train yards where the trains are coming. Rick? The minute they opened the wagons, it was just total, complete uh, misery, beatings and screamings and beatings and barking of dogs and growling of dogs and, and whistles of trains and screaming and beating and screaming and, and commands given. It was, just, it was just like you open the doors and all of a sudden you find yourself in this inferno and in this... In this, in this and this unimaginable uh, 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 horror that you, as a adult or a child, uh, would see nightmares, and it was just coming through. Uh, and we were just hauling on to each other, and and uh, I don't know, within minutes, my mother and my sister were dragged to one side, and I was dragged with my dad to another. We were told to go to another side. And uh, they never had a chance to say goodbye to my mother, never had a chance to say goodbye to my sister. Uh, the, 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 uh, the pace, the speed of this, this thing, it was done by design. It was done to, to both for, for the person not to be able to comprehend or understand or, or in any way be able to think for a second what was happening. It was just... Incredible. It was just an incredible uh, situation. And uh, it was just, as I tell it to you now, it's difficult for me to even describe it because it was happening on a, on a minute to minute uh, situation. And uh, I, got into the, I got into this line, it was this big line, 
And uh, I saw my mother on the other side, there was a, another side where the women went. And uh, I, I, I never saw her cry, I, don't, I never saw her reach out. She just, the last time I saw her, she was hanging on to my sister. And my dad hollered to her, you, hang, you, you take care of her, I'll take care of him, in Yiddish. And uh, whatever we have to do, this was the last word I heard. And uh, my dad threw me in front of him. And uh, he says, keep walking very tall, don't even... Because we were observing what was going on in the front, you know, in the front of the lines. And uh, the, very, the one thing you didn't want is for the Germans to, to see that you were holding on to your child, because that was the whole idea, is to break up the family, murder the family. Uh, that was the genocide of the whole thing. So by not identifying that this is your child, there was a little bit of an edge you had to possibly survive. The fact that you were on your own and you sort of didn't belong to any family. As you can see here, this was a three minute clip and it was just chock full of history and different pieces that you could uh, use with your students and wrap around any historical context during that time. Or even if you were talking about ethics or you were talking about the foundational pieces of genocide as he talked about organized chaos that was intentional because often our students will ask, how could that happen? There were thousands of people there. Why didn't they revolt? Why didn't they just stand up? Where are they gonna go? The dogs were there, there's barking, there's bright lights. And within a three minute clip, if you're getting these questions, you can say, let's, let's watch an oral testimony because um, somebody is talking to that exact piece of how on earth this could happen. And from there, subsequent conversations can occur. So as we look at our last testimony here, Mr. Paul Parks, um, and I did want to share with Mr. about Mr. Lewin. He was seven when the war began. So this was um, a, a, a foundational part of his entire growing up and, and going into his adult life. Um, and he experienced many, many camps um, that was common. Uh, another thing you'll see in oral testimonies is that those who are sharing, they were in six, seven, eight different camps. That's another conversation. Why were they in so many camps? They kept moving them around. Why did they keep moving them around? So one question will be get another question. goes back to what Rick spoke of on inquiry and building it around those standards where you really want your students heavily involved in the content through discussion and through inter uh, um, uh, inquiry into high quality fidelity paced materials. Paul Parks, uh, he was there during the liberation. We're gonna take a listen to his testimony. It's only about a minute long. This is what he saw when the camps were liberated in 1945 and the war was coming to an end. As we got inside, these people came out of these barracks like buildings, their striped uniforms on and just in devastated shape. One of the fellows came out who, who spoke English, and he said, are you Americans? And I said, yes. He said, thank God, and he hit the ground and started to pray. I know I talked to one woman, that's interesting. I talked to this woman who was a child, a young child, and uh, I told her who I was. I was on my knees talking to her, and I told her my name, and you know, it was just a nice kid who was just, and she wasn't in too good a shape, but she was in better shape than most of them for some reason. And we talked, and I, it was over. One day I was in Boston here, and uh, I went to a meeting of the survivors. It was uh, several years ago, it must have been 10, 12 years ago. And this woman, she was at the fair yesterday, but this woman screamed and ran over to me and said, I know you, I know you, I know you. And I'm saying, this woman doesn't know me at all. What you talking about? And she identified herself as the little girl I talked to at that house. And I was just amazed how she would remember me. She said, I know you by your eyes. Again, it's going back to that human story. 
it's going back to those pedagogical principles, that one being number four, about telling the human story. And that's one of the powerful pieces, not only when we're talking about the Holocaust, but as you're talking about other movements as well, is the importance of this work, the ramifications and the, and the fallout from these tragedies and how um, those consequences and those memories and those human stories are still alive today. Um, Dachau being um, one of the first uh, camps that was built. Um, it was on Hitler's list as soon as he came, became chancellor uh, in April of 1933. So this was a very pivotal time uh, for the liberation of that camp. So people often wonder, how can a person's voice do this? How can testimonies be so powerful? Uh, we know from our work at the center, as well as the work of the Shoah archives uh, with over um, tens of thousands of oral testimonies. Ferris State University has 5,500 oral testimonies who the Zeckelman Holocaust Center partners with, as well with other universities to have um, very high quality, um, diverse artifacts and testimonies and materials for us to share with you. A person's voice and oral testimony is able to share this because as we just go through the principles, first of all, a person's testimony clearly defines the experiences from an eyewitness account. The terms are defined. They are sharing with you personally what the Holocaust was and the effects of anti-Semitism. A person's voice and that testimony provides personal background information of the experience. They were there. They will even talk about the clothes they were wearing. They can remember what they were doing, who they were talking to. That woman remembered that man's eyes from how many decades ago. That is extremely personal information. It contextualizes the event, what led up to it, the aftermath. It's all about the human experience. And it is a primary source account. And again, when we want to engage our students, we want to be able to to get to an emotional level, to turn numbers and facts from history into saying, how does this affect me? Why do I need to learn about the Holocaust? That happened over 80 years ago. How does this affect me? It affects us because we're all a part of humankind. And if we forget, we will repeat. So we hope to never forget so that we never repeat. And this is true of all movements or if we're talking about genocides within other factions as well. When we're talking about the Holocaust here, we are sharing the relevance of the event from a personal perspective. We are provoking questions from students to learn more and hear more. Rick and I will, would often get questions. What happened to him? Did they live? Are they still living? Did they get married? Did they have grandchildren? Okay, they're in, they wanna know more. This has become very personal to them and it's creating a clearer understanding of the event. That's why they wanna know more because it's clear to them now. So they're seeing more through oral testimonies, they're hearing more and it's supporting students with content that is not overtly graphic, but it's very powerful. Safely in, safely out. We do not wanna traumatize with traumatic material. Oral testimonies are a beautiful way of a safe approach. So if we take a look at our last side here, as we're talking about the oral testimony within a classroom, what does that look like? Well, one of the things that it looks like is differentiated instruction. All learners have access that's customizable, okay? So it's very visual. You are seeing people talking. You can have closed captions. Um, those who are uh, in special education or ESL, these are different things that can be converted either into their um, native language or into um, a, a content that is digestible for them. It allows various assessment options for you as an educator. You can have formative assessment as you are moving through your content. You can have summative assessment, uh, showing these pieces at the ends of units, uh, and then asking questions, doing quizzes or tests off of them. We all know that teachers have boxes to check. This information helps you with that. Oral testimonies are very fluid. They're very and clear. And also, okay. go ahead, sorry. No, I was just going to also add, that it also leads to a more authentic assessment too, right? So you can also do things like providing them with different oral testimonies where they can do some Venn diagrams, they can do some comparing and contrasting of the different stories and how they overlap with the history, but also how the history is different through the eyes of the person going through it. 
And oftentimes we'll have testimonies to dovetail off of what Rick's saying. We, we will have testimonies that will um, several, like we have several of Margaret's. You can see how their experience moved through time of the Holocaust. You have different study options. Testimonies can be used virtually for homework, uh, online work. They have 24 seven access to testimonies. You can use this for extra credit. You can use it for extension. Uh, you can also use it if we go to the next for group study. Uh, you can have, you have full access to these testimonies. It's easily sourced. It's very transferable. It's very malleable. So students can talk about various aspects based upon the principles. Do you want to focus on terms, timelines, the human story? That's up to you as experts in your classroom. And we're looking to reach all learners. Testimonies can be used virtually. We have face-to-face uh, -face testimonies here, which we hope to see you at the center. Uh, it's a beautiful part of extension work. Oral testimonies are a foundational piece to high fidelity social studies delivery and high fidelity, high quality content to support what you're already doing in your classrooms as experts with your students and experts at what you do. So we hope that the information today has helped you with oral testimonies and feeling more comfortable in using them. Again, Echoes and Reflections has a plethora of oral testimonies. We have access to oral testimonies, the show archives do. So please uh, look at those resources. If you ever have trouble finding some, Rick and I are more than happy to connect with that. Well, we thank you for your time today. I know, Rick, you're leaving them with the last slide with information. And I know that Scott is going to um, put on any questions that we might have. Well, uh, I'm also putting our uh, my contact in the chat box, too. Uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, you can certainly reach out to us as a follow up on where to find some of the testimonies that might work for your needs. And we hope to see you next week for artifacts. Yes. And we're talking about the use of artifacts rather than oral testimonies. So thank you for having us today. And I know Scott is going to close us out. Oh, wow, what a wonderful presentation. And thank you, Dr. Piankowski for it. Mr. Schaffner, thank you. Uh, lots of praise and and, uh, and, and applause uh, coming in our, our question space. I know that it's it's hidden, um, but uh, our, our team, our the MDE team appreciates your efforts. Our, our viewers appreciate your content, knowledge, and expertise in the share. We are short.